Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, uh, welcome this morning. Uh, this is a really big day, and we're delighted to welcome Foreign Minister Maya Hara back to CSIS and back to Washington. This is, I think, the first time since you've become Foreign Minister, and it's a very exciting time for us. We uh, greatly admire his leadership. I've had the privilege of uh, knowing the Foreign Minister for about 10 years, and I said to him, I don't understand how it is that I've gotten older and grayer and heavier and he hasn't changed in 10 <laughs> years. I mean, this just does not seem at all fair or right. Uh, he remains fresh and vigorous, which is actually, uh, and yet wise, because he's been in government now for so many years and has done such a superb job uh, in all the positions that he's had. And in a way, I think it's emblematic of, uh, of what Japan is going through right now. I mean, Japan is simultaneously bridging a world of the past and a world to the future. And it's it's pioneering new directions, and yet it can't let go of what it was and is. And, it, and uh, it's finding that way, finding that way to straddle this important historic moment that holds on to things of value of the past, but brings on this fresh new future. That's what this government is trying to do, and that's what uh, Foreign Minister Mayahara Sensei is doing. So we're, we're uniquely privileged today to be able to welcome him here and to hear him. This is uh, an important time for Japan, and it's a very important time for Japan and American relations. And we have the opportunity now to hear about this and the fresh vision that uh, Mayahara Sensei is bringing to this this morning. And he chose to come here for this opportunity to speak with all of you. He's only been off the airplane for two hours. <laughs> And I will tell you, he only got three hours of sleep on the flight over. And I said, well, that's normal for a foreign minister. So it's been an average day. So we welcome Foreign Minister Mayahara Sensei to CSIS in Washington. Foreign Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hamre. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming, uh, so many people. Uh, I had a uh, uh, chance to make a speech uh, here five years ago, but then much less audience uh, <laughs> because I was an uh, opposition leader then. And now uh, I'm a, a, a member of ruling party. And, uh, uh, foreign minister. Uh, I realize the ruling party is better than uh, opposition party. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm totally grateful for this opportunity uh, to speak today at CSIS, one of the leading think, think tanks of the United States. It was exactly five years ago that I last had the pleasure of speaking here. During these years, political landscape in Japan underwent a significant transformation with the Demo Democratic Party of Japan achieving, achieving the change of government. <clears throat> and CSIS has consistently attached importance to the Japan-US relations and conducted steady research on the subject. I think the latent power of the United States is rooted on the presence of think tanks like the CSIS that analyze information and make policy recommendations and take on extremely useful and constructive roles in shaping public opinions, both domestic and international. I'd like to express my respect to Dr. Hamre, President of CSIS, uh, Dr. Michael Green, who has led the highly respected Japan chair, and other experts of CSIS for their continued efforts and contributions to society. I majored in international politics at Kyoto University. My academic advisor and mentor, 
Professor Masataka Kosaka, before he passed away, gave me several instructions as his last will. One of them was that Japan-U.S. relations must be managed well, in spite of many difficulties. Since I was first elected to the Diet in 1993, I have visited the United States every year to exchange views with U.S. government officials and experts, precisely because I have believed that the Japan-U.S. alliance is the cornerstone of Japan's diplomacy, and that it is essential for statesmen who engaged in governing, governing a country to build a relationship of trust with a partner country. Japan and the United States have faced various bilateral and global issues. The trust between our two countries has worked as a driving force to overcome each of these challenges. Fifty years have passed since the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty was concluded in 1960. This year, 2011, is interpreted as the inaugural year of the new Japan-U.S. alliance, which assures in the next half a century. The NATO summit adopted a new strategic concept last year, in which new cooperative security in the uh, 21st century was introduced. Likewise, the Japan-U.S. relations, which are the most important in the trans-Pacific relations, must be deepened in transformation to a new alliance, responding to the changing strategic environment. Last December, the U.S. Department of State released the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Develop Development Review, QDDR, which shows the U.S. determination to lead the world through civilian power. The QDDR also involved a rigorous review of an effective setup for the implementation of U.S. foreign policy, which reminds us of the distinct character of the United States. That is to constantly aim to improve itself. In particular, it is noteworthy that the QDDR indicates that the U.S. takes measures which include strengthening the interagency approach to the security areas, including conflict prevention, development, peace building, and assistance to vulnerable states by making use of civilian power. I hope that Japan and the United States, in close cooperation, would promote the rise of civilian power in the Asia-Pacific, while making the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty cornerstone of peace and stability. If the Asia-Pacific region were to become a driving force for the peace and prosperity in the 21st century, we need to, we need to bolster the network of civilian power and see to it the democracy and market economies take root in the region. After all, they have brought the most peace and prosperity to humankind throughout history. Today, I wish to share with you my basic thoughts on how Japan and the United States should cooperate with each other in this region which is going through a period of change in order to promote the shaping of a new order and to open a bright future under the theme of opening a new horizon in the Asia-Pacific. 
there is no doubt that the 21st century is the era of Asia Pacific. The three countries of Japan, the United States, and China occupy the top three spots in global GDP ranking. In addition, some estimate that the share of Asia, excluding the US and the other, uh, other Pacific Rim countries, as a percentage of global GDP likely will reach 14 percent percentage in 2030 compared to 25 percentage in 2009. At the same time, we must remember that the rapidly developing Asia Pacific is fraught with factors of instability and uncertainty. The nuclear and missile development issue of DPRK is a cause for major concern. It should be noted that, as seen in the sinking incident of the Republic of Korea's patrol ship Chonam last May, the shelling of the Yonpyon Island last November, and the development of enriched uranium, DPRK these days is escalating the level of its provocation against the region and the international community. In addition, in the case of Japan, we have with DPRK the unresolved issue of the abduction of Japanese citizens. The rise of Asian emerging economies while providing opportunities for the economies of Asia and the world. Also, it's causing tension against the backdrop of the scramble for resources. In addition, increase in military spending by some countries without transparency has become a factor that could potentially raise tension in the region. Thus, with ongoing marriage polarization among the community of nations, we are witnessing a tendency for countries to increasingly pursue their own interests in the absence of a common platform form. The Asia Pacific is a region full of diversity with a multiplicity of ethnicities, cultures, and religions. It is this diversity that is driving the remarkable growth of the region. Diversity with a misstep may turn into a conflict. Instead, it is quite possible to bring prosperity in the region by building on diversity a stronger sense of unity and making the region even more dynamic and open. We should build this new order with a fundamental philosophy that developing the Asia Pacific region through cooperation instead of, in, instead of under hegemony is indivisible from the long term interests of the countries in the region. With this in mind, it will be important to, to develop institutional foundations embodying the rule of law, democracy, respect for human rights, global commons, and free and fair trade and investment rules, including protection of inter intellectual property rights. This needs to be done in addition to developing infra infrastructure that has underpinned the development and economic growth of the region's developing countries to date. For example, Indonesia, a country with the world's largest Muslim population, elects its president through direct ballot and is enjoying political stability as a de democratic state by respecting the freedom of speech 
among, other, among others. These developments have made Indonesia's leadership role in ASEAN more dependable. The Bali Democracy Forum, organized at President Sushiro Bamba Yudhoyono's initiative, is worthy of attention as an Asia originating commitment to democracy. Japan highly appreciates it as an attempt, as an attempt in the region to build an inst institutional foundation called democracy. I myself attended the third Bali Democracy Forum last December on behalf of the Japanese government and gave a presentation titled Democracy in Diversity, Building on Asia's Unique Strengths. Needless to say, whether first rising emerging economies such as China and India will engage actively in shaping the region's new order with full grasp of the common interests of the international community will be crucial. In particular, as China already has grown deep, deep economic interdependence with both Japan and the United States, its peaceful development in harmony with the international community will be in the interest of both of our countries. Japan, therefore, takes interest in the role that China will play in shaping a new regional order in the Asia Pacific. In consideration of such strategic environment, the Japan-US alliance is vitally important, not only to the defense of Japan, but also to the peace and stability of the Asia Pacific region as the region's public goods. I highly appreciate that the United States not only has continued to make immeasurable contributions to the region's peace and stability by maintaining an overwhelming presence in the Asia Pacific, but also has been intensifying, intensifying its engagement in the region under the Obama administration. The top priority task today for Japan and the United States, I believe, is to invest our all-out and all-round effort to shape a new order in the Asia-Pacific region, which finds itself, itself in the middle of a period, period of change. The roles of our two countries will not diminish in any way in the days ahead. In fact, in view of the urgent need to develop institutional foundations in the region today, e expectations are only rising that we play even greater roles. And I feel the responsibilities on our shoulders are very great. To date, to date, Japan has endeavored to promote various regional cooperation in addition to making contributions to the sustainable growth of the Asia Pacific through trade and investment, official, official development assistance, and others. Japan will carry on these efforts. In particular, Japan jointly with the United States has considered important ASEAN centrality in regional cooperation. Japan, therefore, will continue to attach importance to supporting efforts toward ASEAN integration through assistance for the building of an ASEAN economic community by 2015 and the strengthening of ASEAN connectivity. At the same time, we are paying particular attention to East Asia Summit, EAS, among the various frameworks that are involving 
with ASEAN as the ones, as the core. As the core. Japan has cons consistently advanced the idea of U.S. participation to EAS and welcomes the official decisions of U.S. and Russian participation last year. There are some concrete agendas for Japan and the United States to pursue in order to develop institutional foundations in this region, expanding and strengthening the role of EAS is one of them. EAS so far has seen progress in regional cooperation in the five priority areas of energy, education, finance, disaster management, and measures against avian flu. In the days ahead, we wish to bring up for consideration the possible inclusion of security within the scope of EAS. From this perspective, we are looking forward to the role that Indonesia will play as the ASEAN chair this year. These, I believe, are, are in line with the thoughts Secretary Clinton enunciated in her presentations in Hawaii in January and October of last year. The second task is the APEC, which has achieved remarkable progress in creating common platform for the liber liberal liberalization of trade and investment over the past 20 years or so. We shall build on the Yokohama vision, a product of the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting that was held in Yokohama last November, and continue close coordination with the United States, which will chair the APEC process this year from the vantage of from Yokohama to Honolulu. In Yokohama, it also was confirmed with regard to the pathway, pathways to FTAP, free trade area of the Asia Pacific, that concrete actions should be taken by way of building on the regional endeavor, endeavors currently underway. The Trans-Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership Agreement, TPP, can be regarded in particular as a next generation type FTA. As such, it can be an important first, steps, first step towards the realization of an FTAP. If a framework becomes a reality with major global economies such as Japan and the United States participating, it will have great economic as well as political significance. I regard this also as a part of the process of strengthening Japan-US relations. Quite frankly, in consider considering, quite frankly, in considering Japan's partic participation in TPP, Japan has to carry out reforms including agriculture which doubtless will entail difficulties. However, the government of Japan has decided to launch consultations with the countries concerned, as it believe, believes that the revitalization of agriculture and the further opening up of Japan are two object, objectives that can go hand in hand rather than run counter to each other. Thirdly, we should establish closer partnerships among countries that are mature democracies with market economies with a view to building a system of cooperation encompassing both security and economy. One approach in this regard is a consideration of networking in the Asia-Pacific region. If we can expand 
the networking among countries which share the rules, we will be able to reinforce the re region, the region's institutional foundations. In parallel, we should engage in rules-making efforts for new public space, such as the outer space and the cyber space, in addition to ru rules govern governing the freedom of maritime navigation, intellectual property rights, and open skies. For our two countries, for our two countries to play a central role in order to move in the direction I have suggested, an unshakable Japan-US alliance will be essential. Japan and the United States fell out of step last year over the issue of the relocation of Mar Marine Corps Air Station Futenma in Okinawa. At the same time, this satisfaction, this satisfaction grew among Okinawans over the inability of the Japanese government to turn their wishes into reality. The crucial point is that efforts to gain the understanding of local Okinawa community will be essential for the resolution of the issue. It will be essential not to invite a situation that might undermine the functioning of the Japan-US alliance, which has a strategic importance for the region's stability. As the government of Japan moves forward the relocation of Ustenmaya Station, while making clear that it will deliver on the Japan-US agreement of May 28th last year. It therefore will be important for both, both Japan and the United States to contribute their respective wisdom from medium and long-term perspectives and work with unwavering determination to resolve the Ftema relocation issue. From the view viewpoint of setting the right environment to manage the bilateral alliance, the understanding reached in principle between the two governments as a result of the comprehensive review of the host nation support for the U.S. forces in Japan is an achievement of the Khan and Obama administrations. This major political decision to maintain the current level of support over a five-year period in spite of the harsh fiscal condition is a reflection of the recognition of the part of the government of Japan regarding the importance of the Japan-U.S. security arrangement. Last December, the government of Japan devised the National Defense Program guidelines in which a new concept of dynamic defense force focusing operations was introduced in place of the basic defense force concept that aims to secure deterrence by the existence per se of defense capability. Japan recognizes that it is our responsibility to build through its own efforts a defense structure more appropriate for the changing strategic environment in Asia. With regard to the economy, which is the second pillar of the Japan-US alliance, believing that the evolution of the alliance will be founded on robust economies, we shall promote cooperation in new areas of growth and involving leading edge technologies that provide for mutual interest, renewed growth, jobs, and exports, in addition to promoting TPP, which I referred to earlier. More specific specifically, we shall promote cooperation, 
projects such as high speed railway system, including superconducting maglev and environmental technologies, including clean energy. Japan takes pride in its high speed railway system, which operates on time with high level of safety, having had no fatal accidents to date. These are features that are not seen in high speed railway system of any other country. We are convinced that if this high speed railway system, which epitomizes Japan's state of the art technology and incorporate, incorporate, incorporates at the same time maximum consideration for the environment, is introduced into the United States, it will long remain a symbol of our bilateral alliance that is visible to the people of Japan and the United States. The, 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 third, pil the third pillar of our alliance is, uh, is cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. It is often pointed out these days that the number of Japanese students studying in the United States on the decline. I hear that Professor Eiichi Negishi, the Japanese chemist at Purdue University, who was awarded the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, said with a sense of urgency, young folks go abroad. We indeed have to devise incentives to encourage young Japanese who have become inward looking these days to go abroad, including to the US. US. I myself have gained immeasurably from my contacts with Dr. Hamre and many other gathered here over the years. The government, sharing the same awareness of the problem, agreed with the United States in the bilateral summit meeting that was held in, that was held in the margins of the Yokohama APEC meeting last year to step up our bilateral exchanges. Apart from continuing the JET program, which has built up impressive track record to date, the agreement included, inclu includes the dispatch of young, young Japanese teachers to the US and two-way exchanges of students. Last but not the least, what is most crucial for an alliance is mutual trust. In the four months since, I, since assuming office as a foreign minister last, last September, I have built a relationship of trust with Secretary Clinton as one in charge of diplomacy by, for example, having, for example, by having four foreign ministers meeting, including the one scheduled today, I'm convinced that by further deepening the Japan-US alliance, bolstered by mutual trust, we surely will be able to overcome any challenges that will confront the Asia-Pacific region. Japan and the United States build the most important alliance in the world after the devastating, devastating World War II. As most people, including I, were born after the war, there is a tendency today to take the alliance for granted. However, when I put my hands together in prayer to console the spirits of both Japanese and American soldiers who lost their lives in Iwo Jima. The site of a hard fought battle of the, the unfortunate war. And when I reflect on the tra tragic ex experience, experiences 
of the prisoners of war who endured severe ordeal, I am strongly, I am strongly reminded that the, the alliance which binds us was not built in a day. Therefore, it is our duty to make this tie further stronger. The next year, 2012, is the centennial anniversary of Tokyo's gift of cherry trees to Washington, D.C. I wish to express my hope that this year, Japan and the United States would demonstrate their determination to continue to deepen our friendship and to strengthen mutual trust, just as these disprendent uh, sorry, just as these resplendent dental cherry blossoms that adult, ad, uh, adorn the Potomac every spring will continue to bloom. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you, you'll agree that speech reflected exactly this posture that uh, Japan is in. It reflects the wisdom of age and the energy of youth, and it's really encouraging. And I want to say a personal thank you to uh, Foreign Minister Maihara for honoring us today with such a thoughtful presentation. We have a few minutes that we can indulge in some questions, uh, and, and we've got a lot of people that want questions. I'll say, be very polite. If, you're, if you have a lecture you want to give, meet with me later. Tom, we'll start with you. We have a question right down here. Microphone over. Tom, we'll start with you, and then I'll move my way down the hall. Thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, my name is Tom Ok. I'm from Banco Tokyo Mitsubishi FJ in Washington, D.C. Nice to meet you, um, Mr. Maihara. <clears throat> my question is on TPP and Trans Pacific Partnership. That um, um, most of the Japanese business sector, academia, and uh, most of the politicians support that uh, there is, of course, strong opposition in the agricultural sector or some politicians. So imagine if you um, uh, face to face to uh, try to persuade those people in opposition, what's your core message as a foreign minister, foreign minister who knows global world, global economy, and what's going on in the world? So uh, just have your words or a core message, what, what would be? Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, my English is poor, so I'd like to uh, answer in Japanese. Now, that was a question with regard to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the Khan administration has come up with this basic policy on comprehensive economic partnerships. And um, uh, so the policy is to consider our participation in a TPP. Uh, that is the language spelled out in that basic policy. In the, uh, considering the recent statements and, uh, Prime Minister Khan made in the most recent uh, press conference, I believe uh, the DPHA administration will come up with its conclusion by sometime around uh, the end of uh, June. And not sure if it is appropriate for me to express my view as foreign minister on this subject matter. But in any case, <clears throat> Uh, with a view to uh, achieving FTAP, uh, the 21 member economies of a, a APEC uh, have confirmed that they will work towards uh, their economic integration. What pathway shall we choose? Uh, currently, uh, the most um, uh, concrete uh, pathway visible, I believe, is TPP. Uh, true, uh, ASEAN aims at its integration uh, in uh, 2015, uh, and uh, ASEAN and uh, ASEAN Plus Three uh, also are uh, discussing uh, their economic integration or partnerships. But I think TPP is one of the most concrete pathways visible today. Now, what is most important? Uh, what is more important than anything else? Uh, is, of course, agriculture is very important, 
but uh, the uh, uh, primary industry's uh, uh, GDP percentage is only 1.5 percent. Uh, we have uh, protected agriculture over the years, and yet agriculture actually is withering. For example, uh, the average age of farmers today is 65.8, 65.8. Uh, five years ago, it was uh, 60, uh, which uh, shows that no young uh, participation is taking place. And uh, today, uh, rice uh, tariff on rice is 778 uh, percent. Uh, so even with this sort of protection going on, agriculture uh, in Japan uh, will only sort of, shall I say, taper off. And if that is the case, we have to engage in bold reform of agriculture and at the same time uh, look, uh, turn our uh, attention to 98.5 percent of GDP and uh, aim at a more liberal uh, trade uh, structure or trade system uh, and use that as the trigger to uh, rejuvenate the Japanese economy. I think this will be very important. In any case, uh, on the basis of this basic policy on uh, economic, uh, comprehensive economic partnership uh, decided by the cabinet, uh, we'll engage in consultations uh, uh, with the countries participating in TPAP and also uh, by engaging in uh, multilateral uh, trade liberalization efforts. Uh, we'll need to uh, try and uh, uh, energize the Japanese economy and also make contributions to the world economy. Uh, next, and I'll come down here. Thanks very much. Uh, we got a microphone right behind you. Thank you, Harmer san <laughs> uh, Chris Nelson with the Nelson Report. Harmer san thank you for such a strong voice from Japan. It's so important for us to hear that these days, especially with all our Chinese friends running all over town. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you talk about mutual trust, and I, this week there's been a fair amount of coverage on the Japan side of uh, uh, very detailed expectations for results from upcoming ministerials, uh, both defense and, and otherwise, with uh, our, our South Korean allies. Uh, but it seemed that the South Koreans perhaps are, are, are being a little more conservative in their enthusiasm pending other things. and. I'm wondering if you uh, and your government uh, see the need to continue to take uh, more proactive steps to help reduce the unfortunate historical legacy of mistrust that is still in the South Korean electorate, or is it perhaps at this point uh, all we can do is rely on the uh, events with North Korea to help propel uh, a closer alliance? Thank you. Well, uh, th uh, thank you very much. I'm not really sure if I could uh, fully understand the question, but uh, I gather that the question uh, is uh, uh, our relation uh, with uh, South Korea uh, in the context of uh, the DPRK issue. Is that a correct interpretation of the question? Uh, as I stated in my earlier presentation, uh, there was the you know, sinking of the uh, Chonan, the Corvette Chonan, uh, last year, uh, or the uh, uh, shelling of the Yompyon Island, uh, uh, where uh, civilians reside, <coughs> and uh, also uh, North Koreans re revealed their uh, uranium enrichment. Uh, endeavor. Uh, so uh, North Korea has continued to take provocative actions uh, threatening uh, the stability of the regions, and uh, this uh, we are most gravely concerned about. Uh, last December, uh, thanks to the initiative of uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, the foreign ministers of Japan, U.S., and ROK uh, got together and discussed the response uh, and agreed that uh, we should uh, closely coordinate with each other in response uh, to uh, dealing uh, or in dealing with uh, DPRK. And I uh, laud this uh, initiative of Secretary Clinton's. And then following that, uh, 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 
uh, Under Secretary uh, or Deputy Secretary uh, Steinberg visited uh, Beijing, and uh, also I spent uh, I sent uh, Mr. Saiki, who is with me here today, the uh, uh, Director General of the Asian Affairs Bureau, uh, to Beijing and uh, Moscow to explain uh, their thoughts, uh, the thinking of the three countries, and to encourage uh, that the five countries uh, should uh, work together. Uh, in dealing with the uh, DPRK issue, and I think it was very good that we could work out that sort of coordination. Now, uh, I believe uh, uh, what is most important is that the uh, that, that North-South dialogue be opened up, uh, and also in the tripartite foreign ministers meeting. Uh, with regard to the six-party talks that the Chinese have been calling for, we would not reject that, but we believe that uh, it is important for DPRK uh, in the first place to take concrete actions. Uh, and uh, the Chinese, uh, I trust, uh, have uh, communicated this point uh, to DPRK clearly. So I believe that DPRK uh, needs to, in the first place, uh, take concrete action uh, and uh, open up uh, the prospects uh, towards a more peaceful uh, Korean peninsula. In any case, uh, we desire peace. And only through tenacious uh, negotiations, I believe, uh, we can resolve this issue. So we'll uh, keep coordinating with uh, South Korea and the United States and strive for the resolution of the problem. Colleagues, we have really only time for one more question because the foreign minister needs to go to, to meet with the Secretary of State. So let me get a microphone down. Thank you. Um, John Zhang with CTI TV of Taiwan. Um, Mr. Foreign Minister, what is the uh, state of play of Japan-China relations at this time after last year's tension? You spoke about uh, building the uh, institutional foundations for a new order in the uh, Asia Pacific. What kind of a role do you envision China to play in that uh, process? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Last year, uh, within the Japanese waters uh, around the Senkaku Islands, a Chinese fishing, fishing boat rammed into the Japan Coast Guard a patrol vessel, and uh, that led to a rising tension between Japan and China, as you pointed out. That said, seen from our perspective, uh, there is no territorial issue in the East China Sea, and the Senkaku Islands are uh, you know, Japan's uh, uh, territory uh, inalienably, and uh, this will not change uh, uh, forever. Uh, now, uh, Japan-China relations uh, also are very important bilateral relations for Japan, especially interdependence in the economic area is only strengthening, uh, seen from Japan, therefore. Uh, number one export target, uh, export destination is China, uh, and uh, the largest imports come from China. Uh, seen from the Chinese side, uh, the uh, largest uh, export destination is the United States, but uh, Japan is uh, number two. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the largest uh, imports uh, come from Japan. Uh, so, uh, interdependence, economic interdependence between our two countries is growing very strong. And so we need to manage various issues that may arise. Uh, and um, uh, from very broad perspectives, we uh, need to strive to direct our bilateral relations in a better uh, uh, direction. I think that will be in the interest of both of our countries. And, and I trust uh, that the Chinese also have the same view. Uh, next year uh, will be the 40, 40th anniversary since normalization of our relations, diplomatic relations. And so we need to turn this landmark year uh, into a year of uh, greater uh, cooperation and development. And uh, with that in mind, uh, this year uh, we will confirm the various cooperation uh, and in you know, order to build a even better uh, bilateral relations. Colleagues, there are, I have three things to say and then I'm going to get you out of here. First, um, a copy of uh, Foreign Minister Mayahara's 
fine speech is available to everyone outside, right outside when you walk out the door, you should find copies of it. Number two, please stay in your seats so I can get the official delegation and the, and the foreign minister out safely. You know, you know what Washington traffic is like. I don't want the bottleneck down here. And then finally, let's, with our enthusiastic applause, thank Foreign Minister Mayhar for this excellent speech.